I'm going to invite you to Hebrews chapter 4, and I, I want to set the sort of the tone of where we're going, going to go today in this section of Scripture, uh, because theologians say that Hebrews chapter 4 is, according to some theologians, I should say, one of the most complex passages in the New Testament or in the Bible, and uh, I want us to see today, when we walk through this, I'm going to actually go through this fairly fast, first 10 verses, and uh, I think by the time you get to these 10, end of these first 10 verses, you're going to stop and wonder where the complexity is. And I think the reason that people find this complex is because uh, they really start off on the wrong foot in understanding why this was written. But to uh, give you a little idea of why we're in this series together, the topic of the series being called Greater, uh, if I'm just being uh, real truthful with you... Um, and hopefully everything I say is truthful today, by the way. But uh, if, I'm, if I'm being uh, honest with this book and why it's written and why we chose it to do it at this point in our church, uh, in the summertime tends to be a period of time where we do a lot of traveling. If I want to dive into a series where we can pay attention to everything that's involved, um, I know in the summertime is not typically the best time to do that because not everyone will maybe catch up on all the messages, which by the way, if you like this series, you can go online or download our podcast and listen to the sermon series on this, on this topic. Uh, but, but the book of Hebrews is one that drives towards one central theme, theme and the beauty of it. And we, we're talking about in this series the idea of Jesus and him being supreme in all things, which is why we titled it Greater. And we've seen it uh, in, in the first three chapters as it's related these ideas uh, of Jesus to the pictures of the Old Testament. And one of the beautiful things of Scripture is the, the complex simplicity that's described in the Bible. And, and what I mean, I know that's kind of a, it's like saying jumbo shrimp that really doesn't compute in our, in our language. Complex simplicity does not work, but let me explain what I mean. Um, everything in scripture drives to a universal theme. Our redemption in Christ, being made for relationship with God, God pursuing after you in the, in the form of becoming a man, dying for you on the cross so that you can know him and enjoy him for all of eternity. You were created as a worshipful being. God made you in his image for relationship. And the Bible communicates how we find that and its centrality in Jesus. Jesus is what we live for. He is, he is the pinnacle uh, of all things. And so in, in Hebrews, the, the people that are being written to here, I say by the apostle Paul. It's funny, every time I say that, someone always texts me or emails me in the week. Paul wrote Hebrews, if you don't agree with me, you're wrong, okay? Someone will send me another message. You're wrong, pastor. <laughs> so that's what I get this week. But uh, in, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, this is uh, what he says to us. This is where I, I want us to get to this chapter and just really it, this, this verse to resonate with us. It says, let us hold fast the confession our, of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. Uh, the, the band even wrote a song special for this that all your promises are yes and amen, right? So he who promised is faithful. And what that's saying to us is this. Um, the world can throw a lot of garbage at you. And truthfully, as people, we try to put our hope in a lot of different things to find our worth, value, and meaning. But there's one place that is always secure in your life, the place that you were really defined by and created to belong to, and that's in God. And all of his promises are true. And the complex simplicity of scripture is this. When you look at the Old Testament in light of the New Testament, you see how Jesus defines and explains it all. And we've started to see some of those themes throughout the book of Hebrews, and we're going to continue to see it. To the point when you get to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, you should rest and see the beauty of how God has culminated all of this. Talking from temple to law to Sabbath, we're going to talk about today. Why in the world do you even come to church on Sunday? The Sabbath was originally on a Saturday, but why do we do Sunday now? What does that even mean? Why don't we do it like Tuesday at 7 o'clock, a.m. or p.m.? Who cares? Why is it today? Like, we'll talk a little bit about that today. But, but you look at prophet, priest, king, angels, Moses, temple, law, Sabbath, um, sacrifice, whatever. All of it finding its culmination in Jesus, and it helps us to see this, this picture. And the complex simplicity is this, to, uh, for us to recognize that man, things in life can really rob you of your joy in Christ. Can rip down the beauty of why you were created and finding your worth, value, and meaning in him. And we can get sidetracked in that. In fact, chapter 3 talked about us drifting. The danger in the book of Hebrews is that the church is about to go through tremendous persecution and the writer's encouraging them to find their foundation and the identity of who Christ is. And don't move from this because his promises are secure. And that's where you're designed to be rooted in and be defined by and find your worth, value, and meaning in life. 
And so when we see this, this picture today, even, even, to be honest, even in Christian circles, Christians can rob you of that joy or be used as an instrument. But God, God wants you to rest in the simplicity for which he created you in, in Christ. To enjoy him. And this, this morning should not be a, a day about burdens and responsibilities. It should be about freedom and celebration. Our hearts seeing the worth of Christ and a God who came to know us and rejoicing in that proclamation. Rooting our identity in that. And so in, in chapter 3 and chapter 4, just by way of reminder for you, chapter 3 and chapter 4 really run into one another. In chapter 3, the author was explaining through an example of individuals who had the truth delivered to them and moved away from that. They drifted. And in fact, he quoted Psalm 95 in chapter 3 in verses 7 to 11. He quotes Psalm 95, and coincidentally, he quotes in Psalm 95, verses 7 and 11, the same, same verses that are in chapter 3, verses 7 to 11, are in Psalm 95, verses 7 to 11, as an illustration of individuals who, who move from God. They see the glory of God, the goodness of God. In fact, he's using, by illustration, the, the children in the wilderness as they're wandering for 40 years faithlessly after seeing some of the greatest miracles that God would ever perform in all of Scripture, having been slaves in Egypt, now finding an identity in God, refusing to put their faith in God, and now wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. And are you using that as an example that in the midst of the goodness of seeing, being able to see who God is, they still reject the opportunity to put their faith in this God who has loved them so dearly and rescued them from slavery to give them a new identity in Him. And then he uses that for us. Where's our faith? And in chapter four, he continues on, on that theme. And, and this is what he says, verse four to 10. I'm gonna kind of move fairly quickly in this, but I want us to have an understanding uh, of this passage. And I'm gonna explain what the author is talking about, the, the imagery behind all of this. He says, therefore, let us fear while a promise remains of entering his rest. Any one of you may seem to have come short of it. So, so he's, he, he's saying then in response and seeing how other people have rejected, though they had the glory of God plainly declared to them and these wonderful miracles worked in their life, they still didn't embrace God and walk by faith in him. They choose to put their faith in other things. And he's saying, so, so therefore, let us fear if we have a promise to enter into his rest. So the promise to the, the children of Israel were, were, was to enter into this rest in God. And now it's calling us now that we have an opportunity to make this decision to enter into this rest. And so this word rest is a, a theme to this section of scripture. And, and he says it this way, let us fear if we still have this opportunity to enter into this rest. We don't want to come short of it. God's desire for you to experience this rest. Now, when he's talking about the word fear, I think it's important to know that it, what this word doesn't mean is just to be afraid, right? This idea of fear ca carries this thought of a reverence that, that provokes you to respond. When we see the culmination of what Jesus has done for our lives and the alternative to Christ, the, the beauty of Jesus being demonstrated and made, made known, this reverence for this King of Kings who has become flesh to die for us should provoke our soul seeing such great love to respond. And so then he goes in verse two and he conti oh, excuse, excuse me, he continues with this. He says, for indeed we have had good news preached to us just as they also, but the word that they heard did not profit them because it was not united by faith in those who heard. So the response was faithless. And in verse three, for we who have believed enter that rest, just as he has sworn, uh, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. Let me just say, in, in this section, he's quoting Psalm 95, verse 11 again. He's making this theme, that same psalm. He's, he's going back and he's harping on it. He's saying, remember, they were faithless. They didn't enter into this rest. But God is still calling you to, to be in this rest by, by faith. And then it gives this interesting thought, which helps us. It's going to help us in a minute define exactly what this rest is. But he says, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, he starts to talk about creation as a way to understand what this rest exactly means. 
And then he goes on in verse 4 and he says this, for he has said something concerning the seventh day, talking about creation. And then he quotes two passages of scripture. He says, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. So both these passages are men mentioned, one in Exodus 20 when God's giving the law related to the Sabbath, and in Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. And then he says, and again in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. So it's, it's juxtaposing these two positions again, those in rest, those not in rest. Psalm 95, verse 11, quoted in verse 5 once more. But he's saying the answer to understanding this rest finds its origin all the way back to the beginning of creation. And it was so significant that when God brought his people out of Egypt as slaves, when he gave them the law, this moment in creation was defined for the reason which they would have a Sabbath, which is on Saturday. Now, what does that mean? I'll tell you in a minute. But in verse 6, he goes on. Therefore... Since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly had good news preached them failed to enter because of disobedience, which is honestly its faithlessness. In verse 7, he again fixes a certain day called today, saying through David, after so long a time, just as has been said before today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. And so here God starts to say something interesting, a couple things here. Um, God promised Israel, I'll bring you out. You're going to have a Sabbath. You want to enter into my rest, and you're going to go into this promised land. And here now he's saying, and David, who is ruling in the promised land, hundreds of years after it was promised through Moses, who brought them out of Egypt, hundreds of years later, they still haven't entered this rest. So what exactly is this rest? It wasn't just getting into this land. There's something bigger uh, about this rest that's described for us. And then he goes on to say this because in the, in the Hebrew mind in this passage the word rest is equated with Sabbath it's in, in Exodus chapter 20 verse 11 that he just said when God gave the law he told them to observe the Sabbath and so in their mind that's Saturday right and but he's saying in this passage look the rest is even bigger than Sabbath because he starts to define it as today so whatever this rest is right now in these moments we can experience what God is talking about in this passage and so it's starting to hint for us that the idea of Sabbath has a bigger idea than just a day of the week. Very interesting in, in terms of context to the way um, Jews started to respond to what the Sabbath was and the way that maybe we even respond to what Sabbath is. We start to serve Sabbath as if it's an end in itself. Like you look at a system of laws, you obey these laws, and hopefully it gives you better standing before God. And that's not the intentions of Sabbath at all. And so he starts to define it. We'll get into that a little bit more in just a moment. And, but in verse 9, he says this. So there remains, or I should start in verse 8. For if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. So he's saying, look, if Moses and then being led by Joshua in the promised land, if that was the rest God was talking about, then we wouldn't talk about rest anymore. But that's not what God was talking about in the idea of rest. So in verse 9, so there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. And this verse is very important, I think, to understanding. I, I feel like verse 4 and verse 9 in this passage really unlocks the big idea of what's being communicated here. All along, he's referred to this word rest. And this word rest hasn't really meant Sabbath until right now. Where now he is directly equating this idea of rest with Sabbath. And so he's saying, so there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. And in verse 10, for the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works, as God did from his. So God created, and he rested. That's what it's saying at this end. And God's desire for you, in verse 10, is to rest. The world can wear you out. Honestly, we're really good at wearing ourselves out. We look for worth, value, and meaning in so many things in life, relationship, the things we do, the, the gifts that we have, the resources in our lives, as if, as if that, that shows us value, only to find that, that we're only temporary, temporarily satisfied with those things. We, could, we can never have enough to, to curb that, cessation, that, that uh, desire for more in our lives. No matter how much you seek the approval of people, it's never enough, is it, if that's where you find your idol. 
But here it's saying in verse 10, but there is a place beyond all of that where the working ends and the resting begins. So what is this saying? And for fun, why worship on a specific day? How does all this work? Do you need to worship on a specific day? How do you rest? I remember verse four. He's quoting in Hebrews. He's, he's quoting back to the idea of creation. He's quoting from Old Testament law, Exodus 20. It actually starts in verse eight to 11 in Exodus 20, but this is, this is what he says. He says, for in six days, the Lord made heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So when God's explaining the law to the Jewish people as they come out of Egypt, he starts to root his law and identity in the past. And so he, he talks about resting and the need for rest, having to deal with creation. So for us, what, what does this picture look like from the beginning of creation? If that's where we define the intentions of Sabbath, I'll explain how Saturday turned to Sunday in just a minute. But, but here's what it says in Genesis chapter, chapter 1. Let me start here. When God created in Genesis chapter one, you see this repeated in verse five, verse eight, verse 13, verse 19, verse 23, verse 31. The first six days of creation, the same thought is, is repeated. It says, and there was evening and there was morning the first day. And there was evening, there was morning the second day. And there was evening, there was morning the third day. And it goes on all through six days. You get the point. But then you get to the seventh day in Genesis chapter two, verse two. By the seventh day, God completed his work which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day, sanctified it, which is Saturday, because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. Now, when we think about the Sabbath, no doubt the the seventh day of the week is Saturday, starting on Sunday. And so you see in the Old Testament law, the Jews electing this day or being told by God on this day to worship and to observe and to hold uh, the Sabbath. But what it's also communicating here is something significant about the identity of God because when God rested on the seventh day, it wasn't because God was tired. God is endless in his power and might. I mean, he is the I am. He is the definer of all things and he sustains all things in his hands. The reason it communicates to us that God rested is because it's showing a distinguishment in the role that now God is fulfilling in the creation of history. And in Genesis uh, chapter two, verse two, on the seventh day when he rests, it's saying to us, now God has finished his, his creative role and now God is entering into his ruling and reigning role. And when God rules and reign in a place of peace and perfect harmony, there is forever rest. And so the idea when God got finished with creation wasn't that there was just a rest on a single day, but that all of creation being created for his glory and mankind in his image would enjoy the duration of that rest all of their days. So now that God has finished his, his creative work, God now rules on his throne and in the peace of this king, all of creation enjoys the rest under his authority in life. And so the idea of Sabbath isn't just about a day of the week. The idea of Sabbath is pointing to a king who desires for all of creation to rest under his presence. For which it was intended to. But what happens? Shalom is destroyed. Or peace is gone. Sin enters the world. Rest is lost, and now the soul aches. But yet in the midst of this story, in Genesis chapter three, God shows up in the sin of Adam and Eve, and he promises redemption. The peace for which you were created and the rest in your creator being restored. And so Exodus Chapter 20, verses 8 to 11, 
God points Israel to Sabbath using a day of rest as a way to look to the past of what God created us in him to also use that as a place to look to the future in which he would bring in culmination in Christ in all things. So the declaration of a Sabbath is not only remembering the past, but the looking forward to a future hope of a time when we will rest under our king once again. And so Sabbath isn't about a day. Sabbath, Jesus even had to tell the people in his time, man, man was not created for the Sabbath, but Sabbath was created for, the, for man. Its intentions weren't to be an end in itself, but a means to appoint to a greater glory in a God who calls us to worship in peace in him. Look, guys, and we have the tendency in our lives to do this with anything religiously. And we have a tendency, like Sunday morning, we make it this religious duty. It's, it's not a burdensome duty. But it's an opportunity to make a proclamation on a day, recognizing what the king has done in the past and how the king will restore it in the future. Even when you walk in on Sunday morning, anywhere where you serve within the context of this church, it doesn't have to be on Sunday, anywhere, any capacity you ever serve in Christ, we can make ministry just simply about duty, doing it because I'm obligated. Ministry is never about duty. Ministry doesn't exist as an end in itself. Ministry only exists to reach the hearts of people in this world so they could see the glory of this king. Sabbath doesn't exist as an end in itself. Sabbath exists as a place for us to gather and worship in the proclamation of the glory of this king. It is beautiful. And yet religiously, we make it an end in itself. Being here this very morning, I'll tell you why about Sunday here in a morning moment rather than Saturday, but being here this very morning is a declaration of the victory of what Christ has done for you. And so Exodus uh, in sharing this law is Israel really using this one day, the seventh day, and recognizing the seventh day ends and the, the next day, the beginning of the week starts again. But one day, one day, Jesus will end, end all of that and that seventh day will continue forever. In Israel's history, if I'm just... Being fair, there's several passages I could point to in, in how they communicated the Sabbath and the beauty in which it brings. But one other powerful place I just want you to see is Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 12. It says this, Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do, uh, not do any work. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out of there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. So what he's saying is not only is it identity uh, of creation, But it's also a demonstration of your life that that in sin we were slaves. Just like Israel was a physical slave in Egypt, the, the celebration of the Sabbath for us is to remind us that we were slaves to sin, but now been set free in Christ. And for us, it is literally a declaration of the gospel. Jesus in Matthew 2, verse 27 says, Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Just so you can see how this, this picture is painted together in Scripture, when I talk about all the religious things that are done in, in, the, in the Old Testament as not an end in themselves, it says this in Colossians 2, verse 16, I think in regards to just religion in general, it says, Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. Things, look at this, he describes why. These things which are mere shadows of what is to come, but look, the substance belongs to who? Christ. All the pictures of the Old Testament, they're shadows of what ultimately culminate in Jesus, including the Sabbath, Because a day cannot bring you the ultimate rest because what you need is redemption. You need forgiveness. You need God to restore you. And Jesus has done that. And so when we talk about rest, all of it, all of it finds itself in Christ. 
This is why David said, and we read in Hebrews, that today, today you can experience that Sabbath because today you can experience that relationship in Jesus. It's not Sabbath Sunday or Saturday. It's Sabbath every day because of what Christ has done. This is why Jesus, in understanding exactly what he was to fulfill in Scripture, when he shows these pictures, he, how he, he culminates all these things in Matthew 11, look what he says in verse 28. Come to me. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. Jesus is the Sabbath. So some of you may even grow up your whole life and thought there's something special about Sunday. And I would say yes, but only as that picture ties to Jesus. Because the true Sabbath is Jesus. And that doesn't stop on Sunday. That's today. And when we're in tomorrow, it'll be that day. <laughs> Every day, right? And Jesus, look what Jesus says. Because in the, keep in mind, he's talking to religious people. They started to miss the picture of what Sabbath was. They started to treat Sabbath as if it was an end in itself. And look what Jesus says. In that religious system, you get worn out. And he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. It's that simple, Jesus. It culminates itself in, in Christ. And so the application then for understanding Hebrews chapter 4 then ties in the end. He starts to tell us, therefore... Let us be diligent to enter that rest so that no one will fall through following the same example of disobedience that you saw in Psalm chapter 95. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of the soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. What I'm saying is, your soul needs Christ. Your soul needs rest, that you can't fool God in religious living, that you need forgiven, you need redemption, you need restored, you need Jesus. And that the word of God, it lays us bare, it exposes our heart, it shows us our need. It can divide literally the physical from the spiritual. It's powerful, it sees, it sees exactly where your heart is right now where our heart needs to be, which is in rest. And describes it this way, being diligent, being diligent. So the Sabbath is not a, a day of the week, though, though it has been honored in days. It's a, it's a person, it's, it's Christ that I can experience 24 hours a day, 164 hours a week, 365 days a year. So... Why do we corporate Sabbath, <laughs> right? Because everything I just said is basically don't come to church on Sunday now because you can do it every day, right? So why, why, why corporate Sabbath? Why gather together and why proclaim God and why rest in him? Why, why one day a week do we do this? And why is it now not Saturday but Sunday? What happened in, in history that um, made, made this transition for our lives? And I would tell you, I think it is important it is crucial that God's people find a time to rally around what the Lord has done for us and declare that anthem in celebration together. And if we're going to decide on a day to do that, historically, I think it makes most sense to do it on a Sunday uh, for God's people because when we show up, everything that we do, it should be a declaration rooted in the gospel, the story uh, of, of redemption. And the reason is, is when you study uh, contextually in scripture, church history. It tells us in John chapter 20, verse one, that the, the women went to the tomb early the first day of the week in the morning before the sun had risen. So if we're gonna get technical, we should meet before the sun has risen. But the first day of the week, they gather at the tomb to find out Jesus has been resurrected. 
And then when you look at the, the church as it's laid out in Scripture in Acts 20, verse 7, it tells us that on the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, t- Paul taught them. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2, Paul, in gathering together with the church, takes up a collection to support the work of the ministry moving forward and, and the saints in Jerusalem. So it seems in church history, as the women went to the tomb in John chapter 20, verse 1, and seeing the resurrected Christ on the first day of the week, that when they gathered together as a community, they continued to gather together on the first day of the week. Perhaps, this is just a little speculative, perhaps it's because the synagogues were busy on Saturday, and so the only time they could find use to celebrate the resurrection of Christ was on Sunday. But at the same time, you can see in the resurrection of Christ, they continuing to gather on that day. And, and, and I, I think furthermore, just like the work of creation was finished on the seventh day, of the week, the work of the new creation in Christ was finished on the first day of the week because of his resurrection. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. That's your identity in Jesus. I think within the understanding of scripture, when we walk through that door on Sunday as God's family, it is a declaration on the first day of the week how God has made all things new. When we Sabbath now on a new day, it's the proclamation of the finished work of God and the old covenant and the new work of God and the new covenant shaping me new in him so that at this very moment, I rest I don't come to God with my works as as if it's appeasing to him. I don't don't come to God hoping that he accepts me. I come to God because he does accept me in Christ already because when Jesus hung on the cross, he said, it is finished, paid in full in discussion towards our lives in him. And so this is what he says in verse 14 and 16. By the way, this, this ties to the end of, or to the next chapter, but look what he says here. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. It just says it, doesn't it? Rest. Rest isn't a religion. Religion is exhausting. It isn't in possession. Possessions will begin to own us if, as we think that we can own them. Right? It isn't in people's approval because we can't please everyone. Rest isn't a day. Rest is Jesus. It's not until I find my worth in him that I'm truly free. Because in every other case, I'll I'll seek to find my worth and value in anything else, only to find my soul bankrupt. But in Jesus, that acceptance is there. And here's the reality. When you find yourself free in Christ, you're free to move in this world and to serve other people because you no longer need them for your approval because you found your approval in Jesus. And so when you gather on Sabbath, it's this declaration of understanding our soul needs rest. We were created to rest in God. We were created to find hope in God. We were created to find our worth, value, meaning, purpose in God. And every time I rest, even even on Sunday, look, I don't want to tell you Sunday's not this holy, sacred day. I I think in Romans chapter 14, verse 4 and 5, it tells us, uh, let each one be convinced in your own mind. And so if this day is special to you, and I think it should be as a church body because we get to gather, but if there's something special that you've grown up in church and you've made some decisions on this particular day and this is just an important day to you, then let it be an important day to you. If this day draws you near to God, then use this day. Leverage whatever you can to get you to draw near to God and enter into his rest. But see that these aren't ends in themselves, but the means to the end, which is in him. And let me say this. In the midst of this rest, 
is I don't want to make rest just, just about me and just about you, but to understand that this rest also becomes a place where we can invite others into it. And let me just be frank about this for a minute, because when we read, we read passages in the New Testament, you see lots of places in, in Scripture that calls you to go into this world to be a light for Christ. And sometimes as Christians, we can wear, read those things and we can wear them like guilt and then walk in this world and share Jesus with someone as if we did the job that we're supposed to do and we give them a shot of the gospel pill and just walk away. And it just feels like more like forced and guilt and unnatural. And, and, and I think it works like this. I think God desires rather for it to work more like this. When you see who Jesus is, and when you delight in that Jesus, you naturally will share the things that you delight in in the world around you. The things that are most important to you, you talk about with joy in your life. And we go into this world to share Jesus. It feels like a guilt and obligation. Just consider this. I'm not trying to judge us on this, but I want you to consider it. Maybe it's because our own soul hasn't found the opportunity to delight and rest in the God for which we were created to delight and rest in. Because we naturally share the things that we delight over. And when we delight, and when we see that rest for what it is, the desire of our lives should be to share that with those around us. Because it's a gift. You look in the world around you and you see people warring to find peace for their souls. And you find them dipping into wells that temporarily may satisfy but ultimately will run dry because they were created to find their rest in Christ. What a joy that is for you to be able to share. But that won't naturally happen until you see rest, not just a, a religious obligation on the day of the week, but an opportunity every day because of what a king has done from the beginning of creation. As on the seventh day, he stopped and he rested to declare to you, that's where your soul belongs. Mm -hmm.